Welcome back. In this video, we are going to look at the step programmable parameters, which is everything in this gray box right here on your Volca sample. Um, I think a friendlier name for this would be the sound design section of the Volca sample. Basically, this is all of the little knobs that you can tweak and play with in order to change the sound of an individual sample file. Okay, so we're going to look at the step programmable parameters, everything in this gray box, and they are divided into rows uh, there's three different rows, all right, four knobs each, 12 total knobs. So the top row here is labeled as sample, the middle row is labeled as pitch, and the bottom row is labeled as amp. So we'll start with the top row here, sample. So uh, let's see, I'm on the, the 10th default song here. Got some really long samples in there, which is fun. Okay, so <laughs> it's still going. So my first drum sound here. So we've already seen that the, the black sample knob here, that just rolls you through all your different sounds. All right, so just for selecting a sample. Uh, so now let's get into the these two knobs here, start point and length. Uh, so sample start point and sample length. Now these two knobs are kind of uh, a pair, they go together. So let's find one of those really long samples. There we go. So number six here is this long, it sounds like a cello type of sound or bass type of sound to me. Um, okay, so the start point, so if you start at zero, that is starting the sample at the earliest possible point, so the very beginning of that audio file, all right? Um, so let's leave that start point at zero for now and play with the length first. So the max length is 127. That means that it's going to play the entire uh, sample file, which in this case is very long. I don't know what that is, 15 seconds or something, right? So um, as I start turning this down, you'll hear that the sample playback will just get shorter and shorter. So this number 127 is kind of arbitrary. It's not seconds or anything. There's not percentage. You can think of this as like 100% basically, and you're turning down the percentage, but um, it's, it's just kind of an arbitrary number that they're using. I get it down real short, like let's try about 10. There we go. So that super long sample is now very, very short, right? And you can make it longer. Okay, so um, that's just yeah, changing the length of the sample, the duration. So the start point knob is saying, where in the audio file do you want me to start? playing. So think about it in kind of like time codes. So if it, let's say your sample file is 15 seconds long, do you want me to start playing at time zero, at time, you know, one second, time two seconds, like that. Um, so you can choose any point, right? So I could have a 15 second long sample file. I could start playing at second 14, and that's now going to be a one second long file, right? Um, so you could do that kind of thing. Now, in reality, as you turn this, this is not seconds. This is just kind of an arbitrary uh, you know, a range of 0 to 127. So you can think of it kind of like percentages. Honestly, I wouldn't worry too much about the number, just listen. Um, but the numbers are helpful because if you want to, like let's say I find something I really like and I want to copy it over somewhere else, I might need to memorize those numbers uh, briefly so I can punch it in over there. Okay, so we have this really long sample here. So I was just counting in my head, and that was about 15 seconds long for that place. So it's a very, very long sample. So start with your start point set to zero, and your length set to the max, which is 127. Okay, and that means that uh, start at time code zero. So whenever the audio file starts, start there, and then play the sample as long as it possibly is. So in this case, it's something like 15 seconds. All right. Now, if I tweak my start point, I'm telling it start playing further on in the sample. So instead of starting at the very beginning of the sample, start a little bit in, you know, maybe at one second in or two seconds in or something like that. So I'm gonna just tweak that. Let's turn this to 50 or so, 50, 49, whatever. So it was shorter now, that was about eight seconds. 
right? Because I told it to start at a later point in the in the audio file. And now length is just telling it when to stop playing, right? So now if I turn this back down to oh, say 70, now we should have a much shorter file that plays. Okay, so it's something like six seconds. Five seconds maybe. So you see by tweaking these two, we're just changing the duration of the audio file. And they, they kind of work in tandem, they work as a pair. So oftentimes when you change one, you often want to change the other sometimes. Um, one of the areas where start point and length are really, really useful is when we're looping things. So um, let's turn on the looper for this particular part, right? So that's function and number, uh, the 11th touchpad here, right? So now we have loop is on, okay? And I'm gonna turn off this motion sequencing because we don't need it right now. So I just have loop on for this one part. So now I'm going to I'm going to solo this part so we can only hear this one song, this one sound, I mean. So right now it's triggering just once, the beginning of every 16 step sequence, right? But I have loop on, so it's going to trigger and then it's going to loop. Uh, so let's hear how that sounds right now. Okay, so currently my sample is longer than this 16 step sequence. So, it's, so the loop's not really doing anything right now. Well, watch what happens as we make it shorter. So I'm gonna start dialing down the length. Okay, so now it's starting to loop. Turn up the start point. And you hear that kind of click or pop that happens? That's a common thing that happens when you start looping samples that there's tricks to avoid it, but for now, don't worry about it. So let's see, I'm gonna go back to the, the zero start point. that. So we can do some really kind of fun things. Take just a little piece of a sample, loop it over and over. So what we're doing right now is actually the basis of a much more advanced technique. Um, for doing granular synthesis on this. We'll get into that later. Um, for now though, just know that the start point, the length, and the loop functions, they all play really well together. So try playing with all those as one. Let's do the same thing with a different sound maybe. So let's switch to, I'm gonna solo maybe that sound. What's that sound like? Okay, great, let's do that. So currently that one is set to trigger again once, I'll do it on the first one again. So it's set, set to trigger once per 16 steps. So let's hear how that sounds right now. That's, I have set uh, start point to zero and length to max. Okay, so there's my full sound. Oh, and I'm gonna turn off that again. Okay, so let's do this again. We're gonna turn on loop and start playing with these. So you can get all kinds of crazy different sounds and effects and things um, from a sample that you know sounds nothing like this normally, just by playing with loop, start point, and length. Okay. So there's that. So the next little function we have here is high cut, and uh, remember in the effects video we talked about the analog isolators, bass, and treble uh, as examples of filters. Well, the high cut is also a filter. Um, so the other term for this would be a low pass filter. High cut filter, low pass filter, it's the same thing. So we're allowing uh, the low frequencies to pass through and we're cutting or removing the high frequencies, right, when we use this one. So if we take, we'll just take our same little sound here. All right, and as I start turning down the high cut, here it's cutting out all the high frequency parts of it. In this case, there isn't much of a low frequency on this sound, so when we turn it down too much, it basically just mutes the sound. All right, so the max value of 127 means I'm allowing all frequencies to pass through, and as you turn it down, it's just cutting the high frequencies. 
So let's hear that with maybe a different sound. Uh, let's see. Let's... I'll try it with this one here. Okay. Okay. People also often use the terms darken and brighten a sound. So to darken a sound means to turn down a filter and remove high frequencies. Like that. So they would say that's the darker version of this sound, and the brighter version would be to increase the high frequencies. Right? Um, so again, this this one right here, the high cut, it's basically doing the same thing as the treble knob here, uh, at least in terms of like from the high noon position on this treble knob down to the minimum value, that is effectively the same as what this one's doing. The big difference being that this one is per part versus this one is global. It's for all 10 parts simultaneously. But you can kind of use them in conjunction, right? So we're only listening to this one part right now. It's triggering once per uh, per 16 step sequence. So let's, all right, let's turn off the rest of these. Okay, so there's my sound. I can kind of tweak both of these together if I want. So basically this one doesn't have a lot of treble, so this, this knob's not really doing anything because this particular sound just doesn't have much treble in it. So the bass knob should work then. See, that made the, the sound a lot thinner, took out a lot of the bass frequencies. Or we can boost it to make that sound really kind of fat and full. All right, so by turning high cut down, see I'm way down on this, and by turning the bass one up, now I'm getting just these low bass tones out of it, which are quite nice. So you could use kind of a combination of these two things. Uh, the issue is that, again, this one is global for all of them. So um, it's going to be tough if you're trying to just shape one sound with this, but you can. Okay. So uh, now let's move on to the second row here. Uh, that's all labeled as pitch. So speed we've already played with a little bit, and uh, speed is playing, it's changing the playback speed of that sample. And when you play back uh, any audio file faster, it's going to increase the pitch, it's going to make the sample play back at a higher frequency, and when you play it back slower, it's going to decrease the pitch or make it play back at a lower frequency. And this is the same as if you've ever played with a vinyl record player or a tape player that lets you change the speed. You know, you can get people to sound like chipmunks or whatever. So we're basically doing the same thing here. with some of these knobs this one has a notch right at high noon there so you know when you're always at the default speed right uh, so that one's very powerful and if you're trying to write melodies at all uh, in terms of you know making different notes uh, this is going to be extremely useful and powerful for that okay. okay so now uh, the rest of these are related to the speed knob so you can think of speed as kind of like the master knob for this whole roll, this whole row. Um, and everything else here is, uh, it's, it's just tweaking a bit what the speed knob is doing, all right? So with the speed knob, I'm gonna turn it up just a little bit. Let's try 10. Okay. Oh, and this, oh, I can leave loop on, that's fine. So now it's this EG int. Uh, that stands for Envelope Generator Intensity. Don't worry what all that means right now, just, just kind of listen. Okay. 
And something else I'm going to do just to make this a bit more obvious is I'm going to just add a ton of steps here to this one. So basically what this knob means is it's how powerful is this knob? You can think of it as like a multiplier, right? Like one times one still equals one, but one times 10 is 10, it's 10 times as powerful. So that's kind of what this one's doing. It's multiplying the effect of the speed knob. So watch if I have the EG int knob turned way up, right? We have that. Now when I change the speed knob, it's gonna be a more drastic effect. Versus if I turn the EG int back to zero, the speed knob still basically functions the same, it's just a little less intense. Okay, uh, so attack and decay are also related to speed. So an envelope is basically, it's just like an envelope uh, that you'd put a letter into to mail it. An envelope in sound is something that wraps around uh, a waveform. We'll talk about that later. But so just know that attack and decay are basically the start and the ending point. So attack means when, a, when you first hear a sound, uh, do you hear the sound immediately or does the sound kind of fade in? It starts at volume zero and then slowly fades in. So at the, um, the minimum here, we're just gonna hear the sound immediately. So here, let's turn off all these steps. Actually, I'm just gonna live play it. So with the attack at zero, we're just getting the sound in its kind of basic form. And let's turn off the looper here. Okay. So as I start turning the attack up, we're gonna get this effect where it kind of, the volume fades in. And again, the EG intensity, uh, envelope generator intensity knob, that's gonna affect how powerful these knobs are as well. So I'm gonna turn that up just to make it a more dramatic effect. So here how it's kind of ramping up like that, versus if I turn these both off, it's gonna sound a bit different. So you can pretty drastically change you know, the overall sound there. So decay is uh, is looking at the end point of that. So at the end of the sound, do we want it to just cut off abruptly? That would be zero decay. Or do we want it to slowly fade out, like the volume is gonna slowly fade out over time? That would be a long decay or a high number here. So let's listen to that. So with my delay at the max number of 127, that is, uh, that's the longest that that sound's gonna be, basically. Okay, or if I turn it way down, it should cut off more abruptly at the end. So the sound just stops, there's kind of no tail to it. And then somewhere in the middle is gonna be somewhere in the middle. So this bottommost row here is labeled as AMP. AMP stands for Amplitude Envelope. So the up here in the pitch envelope, we had one kind of layer wrapping around our sound in order to tweak it. This uh, Amplitude Envelope is a second layer that we've wrapped around our sound that we can tweak it even further, all right? So, uh, so you can just think of it as doing a similar thing, it's just a, a second layer around. And so with this amplitude envelope, we have a couple different controls. The most powerful one here, here being level, and that's just volume as we've seen, All right? So let's, let's maybe pick a new sound here. 
Now we already did that one. Okay, so we'll go with this sound right here. So you turn down the level, you simply stop hearing it. All right, that's just the volume. Pretty easy. Somewhere in the middle. Okay, pan. So for pan, you're either gonna have to be wearing headphones or have uh, you know really widely spaced speakers in order to tell what it's doing. But pan is just going to the left. So if you're wearing headphones, you should hear that pretty much only in your left ear or versus only in your right ear for that one. And then up in the middle, center, it's, it's playing equally in both ears. Okay, and so notice also that uh, pan is a stereo effect. It's the only stereo effect that the Volca sample really has. And um, so that means that you, you're gonna have to either output uh, to headphones, which are always gonna be stereo, or you're going to output to a pair of speakers. If you only output to a single speaker, then a single speaker can't produce stereo sound. Uh, I can kind of fake it, but to get real stereo sound, you have to have at least two speakers, a pair of speakers. Um, and also, you're going to have to record into a, vi a device that can record stereo. So um, if you're only recording mono, that effectively means you can't use this pan knob. Not a huge deal, but you know it is a fun thing to play with. So the next one here is attack. Uh, and so just like the attack and decay in our pitch envelope generator here, uh, this is doing the same thing, right? So attack is uh, how quickly or slowly does the sound start, and then decay is how quickly or slowly does the sound end. So in this one, all right, so that, that's just our attack is zero, meaning we hear the sound right away as I press the button. As I start turning it up, you'll hear kind of a lag before we hear the sound. There we go, see now, it, the sound is kind of fading in. It's starting at volume zero and fading into whatever level, whatever level we have set right here. Right. So that's why these are all linked because basically this is saying how quickly do you want me to increase the volume until I hit whatever is set on my level knob over here. Right. So I'll set the level knob to max to 127 and I'll keep turning up the attack. So with a really short sample like this, you'll, you might get to a point where you actually stop hearing it. See how it's getting quieter? Even though my level's all the way up, as I turn my attack up, we can't hear it at all. The reason being, I've now made such a gradual slope going from volume zero to this level that that slope is now longer, the duration of that slope is longer than my sample. So effectively, we've just muted the sample right now. So, be careful with the attack knob. If you're using it on a short sample like this, you can easily get into this territory where you just can't hear it anymore. Okay. So let's try that with a really long sample like we had uh, on six here. And here I'll set these this back to its max length. Okay, so that's our full 15 second thing. Oh no, it's actually still cutting shorter, isn't it? Oh, this is just a different sound. Okay, let's do it with this sound. Okay, so I've got my level set to max, 127. And now and my attack is at zero. So since this is a long sample, I should be able to have a really long attack and still be able to hear it. So it's maybe a little subtle, but what you should be hearing is that it's starting quiet and getting louder over time, right? Uh, so with decay, I'm gonna set my attack back down to zero uh, so that we can play with decay. Decay is doing the same thing just with the tail end of the sound. So right now, decay is at zero. That means that it's going to immediately stop playing. So basically we should hear nothing. Right, there we go. Um, so if your decay is on zero, uh, again, you've effectively muted the sound because it's, you've given it zero seconds to play. So as I turn my decay up, it's going to say, I'm starting at whatever level I have set here, which currently is the max at 127, and then I'm reducing the volume down to zero. So when decay is set to max 127, it's effectively doing nothing. It's saying, 
I'm allowing the sample to play out as long as it possibly can go. So as I start working it down, I'm telling it fade out. Make sense? So you really, you can think of attack and decay as fade in and fade out in terms of volume, right? And the, on the pitch row here, the attack and decay are like fade in, fade out in terms of the effect of these two knobs. So that one's a bit more complex, but effectively that's what they mean. Definitely uh, you think about these in rows because they're all kind of linked together in rows. When you start playing with one, chances are the other ones in that same row are going to have related effects to whatever it is you're doing to your sound. Um, and also, it's always fun to play, to move more than one knob at a time, right? That's one of the whole points of doing this in a piece of hardware versus in software. In software, if you only have a computer mouse, uh, you know, you can only move one knob at a time, right? But here, we have two hands or multiple fingers, you can move multiple knobs. So let's turn on, uh, I'm just gonna turn everything back on in this song, and I'm just gonna start playing with different stuff, uh, different knobs all together, and we'll see how that goes. And remember, I also need to switch which part I'm, I'm working on, right? We'll also mention another thing that's a little bit quirky about this and different machines uh, function a little bit differently from this one. So with this one, um, like as I'm switching between my parts, you know, the knobs are all pointed in these kind of random directions, right? So like if I switch to this part, well, the current state of these knobs isn't necessarily reflecting what this part is doing. So as you first play with the knob a little bit, it's going to jump to whatever value it says on the screen here which can be a good thing, can be a bad thing, depending on what you're trying to do. It can make the transitions between these things a little bit jerky, which is generally not good. But, so let's take one of these. Yeah. See, this one I can barely hear. I wonder why. Turn the volume up, the level. There we go, that's why, it was this high cut. Okay. So yeah, unfortunately there is no way around that with the Volca sample, it's just when you tweak a knob, it's just gonna jump to whatever value you're at. That's just how it works. Okay, so now the really fun part about all of these, uh, I mean, not only can you use it to change the way the sound uh, is heard, you can also record all of your knob motions here, all right? And that's with uh, what we call motion sequencing. So to access that, it's on this 12th button here. All right, well, it's 12 and 13 are both related to motion sequencing right here. So you hold function, turn on motion sequencing right there. So that's function and the 12th pad. Now for whatever, and that is per part, right? So if I switch to a different part, that one is off, right? So I'm only on my second part here. So what this means, I'm gonna mute, or here, I'll solo just this. So we're only hearing the second part currently is just firing twice like that. I'm gonna make it fire every time just so it's super obvious. Okay, so I've got motion sequencing turned on, all right? Now the way you do this is you just hit the record button. So now instead of recording notes that I'm playing, I'm gonna record knob motions up here, all right? So I'll hit play so I can hear what I'm doing while I'm doing it. And it's still recording, see? Now, as I start to tweak something, like I'm going to tweak this high cut knob. Hear that? So, motion sequencing is basically a robot that will mimic whatever knob motion you did. So, on that one, as it was playing, I turned the high cut down and then I turned it back up. And now, as it plays back, you'll hear that motion in the sound. Down and back up. Down back up. 
right? And now uh, let's say, I'm like, ah, that sounds okay, but I think maybe I wanna do something different. Well, function clear, right? So function 13 will erase anything you've done. So you get to start over. Just like, it's just like the clear part, but for motion sequencing, all right? So now we're back to default. So let's do another motion sequence. So I'm gonna hit record. Motion sequence is still turned on. I'm gonna do, let's play with the pitch. Okay, and so notice it automatically stops recording as soon as it hits the end of the sequence and loops back around. So from wherever you start tweaking the knob, it'll give you a full 16 steps uh, and then loop back to that point. So if I start tweaking the knob here on step eight, I'm gonna have the rest of these and all of these first seven, and then once it hits that eight, that's gonna stop recording automatically, which is great. Uh, so let me demonstrate that. I can keep, keep playing with the knob after the recording's still done, but it's only gonna record those first 16 steps. So I'm gonna clear what I just did, and then uh, let's try this again. Record, motion sequence on. automatically turn the record off once it hit those 16 steps. So that's a really, really useful thing. Basically, you just play with it as much as you want. It's gonna record the first 16 steps and then stop automatically. You don't have to worry about the timing of when you're done, basically. And notice it lights up the knob, showing that there is motion sequencing there. And the other great things, you can just toggle motion sequencing on and off. So function, turn it off. Now it's just doing whatever the state of this knob is. There we go. So I can have that be part of my song and then turn it on to get an alternate part of my song. All right, so it's gonna remember whatever your motion sequencing was. So currently I'm only doing that one knob, but we can do more. Let's just add more, hit record again, and I'll start playing with some other things. See now both of these are lit up. So I've got speed and high cut both applied to that. And you can do that with all of the clear knobs here. Not the sample knob, but all the other ones. You can just do this as much as you want. Oh, I forgot to record. All right. And a really fun one, right, here, I'm gonna clear all of those just so you can hear this clearly. A really fun one is to motion sequence the pan knob. Now again, you're only gonna be able to hear this in headphones uh, pretty clearly, so this is gonna work best if you're in headphones. But uh, so let's play that, record. Right. So you should, if you're wearing headphones, you should hear that sound passing back and forth between your different ears. So that's fun. So one other thing to point out, if, you, uh, if you've done some motion sequencing and you want to get rid of a single knob without erasing everything, you know, function clear will erase everything you've done, but maybe you just want to get rid of something you did to a single knob and keep the rest. So let me demonstrate that. So I've got the pan knob going. I'll add a few more. Okay, so now I've got all three of these knobs. Let's say, let's say you know, eh, you know, I don't really like what I did with this level knob. So all you have to do is uh, be in record mode again, motion sequencing on, just tweak it a little bit just gonna turn it so it's like going between two different values here, you know, 115, 116. And so effectively that is still motion sequencing that knob. It's just, I'm going between two little values, you'd never really notice the difference. So that's kind of a way of more or less erasing what that one knob is doing, uh, because I'm just telling it stay, you know, basically consistent through the whole thing. So technically there is still motion sequence data there, but you know, it's effectively erased because we're only going between you know, in this case, 115 and 116. Uh, so you can do that um, for pretty much any of them. If, but if for something like the speed knob, eh, that may not work, let's try it. So speed knob's currently on zero, right? Even going between three and zero is a pretty big effect, right? So for some knobs, that's maybe not gonna work so well. So if you want to uh, erase that, in that case, I'm gonna have to just hit clear and erase everything, unfortunately. Uh, well, let's see, maybe I can erase just the speed knob, with that little trick. So there we go. So basically, 
I hit record. I just twiddled it a little bit to get it to read zero. And that wiped it out. So you can do it with any knob. It's just you might have to fiddle with it a little bit in order to get it to kind of go back to zero. So I also want to share, there's one other little kind of pro tip when it comes to the speed knob specifically. Well, I want to call this a pro tip, but it's in the manual, so I, it's a lazy pro tip, I guess. Um, so with the speed knob, like I said, we can use it, take any sound, pitch it up and down, right? And you can use that uh, to write melodies if you want to. So, um, but when you're doing this, it's kind of hard to figure out what notes you're playing. Uh, if, if you're imagining something like a piano keyboard, it doesn't really line up exactly. Um, this would be like, trying to write melodies like this would be like uh, playing a single string on a guitar and turning the tuning peg while you're playing that string in order to pick what notes you want to play. You can do it that way, it's just kind of not a way we're used to doing it. We're used to doing it in terms of separating out different notes, like on a piano keyboard. Well, you can actually do that with this. So if you hold the function button while you turn speed, so I'm going to hold function here, turn speed. So now see it says NT, that stands for note. And so it's going up and down in semitones, which means a half step. So I'm gonna put this on loop so that we can hear it happening over and over. And I'll turn off all my motion sequencing. So we're just hearing the straight sound, right? I'm gonna hold function here and turn the speed knob. So it's doing the same thing, it's just doing them with uh, in, in these, these semitone steps. So maybe it'll be a bit more obvious if we find a more of a, a piano type sound, basically. Um, so let's see, let's find something. And we can go with this, this kind of cello sound again. So I'm gonna turn its length to be pretty short. Oh, that was this one, sorry. something short. Okay, so there's that. Sequencing off. Oops. <laughs> Let's just solo this one. There we go. And I'll have it fire every time. No, oh, what did I do wrong? I'm just in the wrong part. So there's that. So now I can pitch it up and down. Get different sounds, but if I hold function while I turn that. Right. So I don't know what sound what note this is actually playing, but let's just say it's middle C on a piano. So if I turned it up. Uh, one semitone, that would be like C sharp. So here. Okay, so let's say this is C, so that would be C sharp, D, D sharp, E, and so on. So if you're trying to really like dial in and write a melody that way, you can do it. I mean, I admit it's, it's a fair bit of work compared to just playing it on some other type of instrument, but that's the way that you can do that with this.